<laughs> I mean it when I say I feel like I'm coming home. I really do. Um, did I grow up in St. Louis? No. As a matter of fact, this is only my third time in St. Louis. Once to preach uh, at a banquet for uh, the Midwest Messianic Fellowship. The other to visit my son, who has, now lives in Chicago. And this is the third time. So it's not that I grew up here, but I feel like I'm coming home. Why? Because of Brooks Bible College. Let me explain to you. You say, are you a graduate of this school? No. It's only my third time here, all right? Um, my dad died when I was 16 years old. And in five months, a few months after that, I turned 17. And in the early months of my 17th year, I came to Christ. I grew up in South Carolina, so I'm not from here. What's Brooks got to do with that? Um, I was saved in a church called Church of the Open Door in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Um, a small church. A church that um, every person in the church had a Schofield reference Bible. <laughs> Old Schofield reference Bible. My mother, unsaved at the time, gave to me, early in my Christian life, a copy of the Old Schofield reference Bible. Let me tell you, I'm, th I'm a thoroughgoing Protestant. I don't believe in relics. I don't believe in holy objects. But that Schofield Reference Bible is a relic. It's a, it's a holy object in my library. It's on the shelf there. You can borrow any of my books, but you cannot borrow the old, my copy, my first Bible. Because I came to Christ through that church and that Bible, and I studied the Word of God in that Old Schofield Reference Bible. It's a holy relic for me. Don't you touch it. Uh, um, all right, well, what's that got to do with you? James Brooks, as most of you know, was a 19th century man who discovered premillenarianism, uh, as he called it, premillenarianism. He didn't call it premillennialism, premillenarianism. As a matter of fact, one of his classic little writings is How I Became a Premillenarian. Hard to even say that, much less uh, you know, comprehend it. James Brooks was the mentor and tutor of C.I. Schofield. And most of you probably know all of that. So I feel like I'm coming home, back to my roots. Uh, uh, where uh, James Brooks, of course, as you know, founded this school. Not naming it after himself. Uh, later it would be named that, and you probably know that far better than I. So I feel like I'm coming home. These are my people. These are my doctrines. Uh, and uh, I uh, hope I've never moved uh, from them. The Church of the Open Door is no more. They moved to another uh, building. Uh, the original Church of the Open Door was an old, uh, can you believe, a World War II Quonset hut. You kids don't know what a Quonset hut is. But it was actually built uh, uh, during the Second World War. And then after the Second World War, uh, that, uh, they refashioned that Quonset hut into a church building. H.A. Uh, Ironsides, does that ring a bell? H.A. Uh, Ironside, Moody Memorial Church, Chicago, Illinois, preached the dedicatory sermon. I was not there then. That was <laughs> 1947 and I was born. Uh, the, the, oh, 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 I'm sorry, I gave away my age. <laughs> As if I could hide it. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, uh, so I feel like I'm coming home. All right, uh, yes, I did bring some books. I didn't come to sell books, but they did say that they'd have a book table and 
that that beautiful lady sitting back there at the book table, if you give her the money, I hope she'll give it to me. Okay, good. Uh, there's a few books for the elephants and the giraffes, and then there's a couple of books for the rest of us, as my wife says. This is for the uh, giraffes. Uh, James, a commentary on the Greek text, uh, so you won't get too much out of it if you, uh, unless you're familiar with the Greek New Testament. My wife says, honey, write a book for the rest of us sometime. So I have. And here's James, a devotional commentary. Just five copies back there. Uh, and that's a book, quote, for the rest of us. Um, I also wrote a commentary on the Psalms, a devotional commentary on the Psalms. We have some copies back there. And then something that um, uh, shows you my interest, the Messiah. Uh, revealed, rejected, and received on the Messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. I had the privilege of working with the Jewish mission uh, for a number of years, 17 years, the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry, and these were initially chapters in Israel, My Glory, and I refashioned them into a book, and it's the Messiah, how we can know who He is from the Old Testament, how you answer Jewish objections to the Messiahship. So, enough said about that. Uh, you say, how much uh, are they? Well, I'd like to say they're free, but uh, they're not, uh, and, uh, and some of them are thick, some of them are thin, and so rather than say 5, 7, 15, 20, let's make each one of them $10. It'll all balance out that way, uh, because uh, most of them are over $10, but $10 is enough. And if you, if you give the money to that lady, uh, uh, I'll, I'll make sure she sees me afterwards. Okay, good. All right. You will, won't you, see me afterwards. Okay, good. Now, this is a, a, a uh, conference on premillennialism. Now, uh, I'm going to surprise you. You may be wondering, 10, 15, 20, maybe even 30 minutes into this message, you may be wondering as to what's this got to do with premillennialism? Sit tight, listen up, it does. I and my colleague have planned the attack this weekend and he's going to be looking at big picture uh, macro issues of theology and history as it relates to premillennialism. We agreed that I would look at exegetical, expository studies on the biblical texts that I believe support premillennialism. So uh, I'm sorry that Doug's not here right now. He has a, a, had a death of a very close friend and he's going to be coming later. I don't know if you were informed of that. but uh, So I, uh, you're stuck with me for both sessions tonight. He arrives at the airport around 9 o'clock. So uh, he'll be on, uh, on tomorrow. He'll be looking at big picture macro issues. What is premillennialism as a theological system and, and, uh, and its history and so forth. I'm going to look at texts that I believe support premillennialism. But to do that, we're going to be looking at Old Testament texts where the millennium is not mentioned at all as the word. Okay? Because premillennialism is taught all through the Bible, even though some of our opponents will say, well, millennial, it's only taught in one chapter, Revelation chapter 20, where the thousand years are uh, mentioned. That is true. The term thousand years uh, to describe this period, this kingdom, is only in one chapter. But premillennialism is more than just one chapter in Revelation 20. Uh, premillennialism is a system of interpretation that touches far more than one chapter. When we speak about the future kingdom, we're talking about the millennium. That's what we mean. So there are many, many passages in old and new that speak about the future kingdom. It is not until Revelation 20 that the length of that kingdom is mentioned. All right? So you may be wondering, what's Hosea and Gomer and some of these kids with crazy names uh, got to do with premillennialism? Sit tight. By the end of this first message, or I should say, keep cool. Uh, uh, keep cool. Uh, uh, by the end of this first message, I think you'll see why what I'm going to talk about tonight is absolutely essential as a foundation 
for premillennialism. The teaching that when Jesus comes in glory to reign over this earth, there will be a period of time of a thousand years prior to uh, the great white throne judgment and the new heavens and the new earth. You say, okay, so what's the big deal about it? The big deal about it is that it impacts on how we read the Bible. And that's why people like James Brooks and C.I. Schofield and uh, William Pettingill and some of these others, editors of that old Schofield reference Bible, they knew what that meant because it, it, our view about the millennium really impacts how we interpret all the Word of God. Are we going to accept it for the plain language that it states or are we going to spiritualize it or allegorize it and explain it away? It is that important. So when people say, oh, it's just in one chapter. Oh, it's just an eschatological view. It really isn't that important. Well, I'm not going to say it's going to get you into heaven or keep you out of heaven, although I've known quite a few people who've come to Christ through prophecy conferences. I'm not going to say that. But if it does impact how we interpret the Bible, it is very, very important. So turn to Hosea. Turn to Hosea. All right? Uh, you say, what's Hosea got to do with the millennium? I hope you'll see by the end of this message that it does. Now, Hosea is a love story. Do I hear an amen? amen. Are you from churches that say amen or are you? Amen. Uh, uh, all right, good. You know, uh, at Grace Community Church, we've got 6,000 people there. And if I said amen in Grace Community Church, 2,000 heads would look at me like, hey, Lawrence, uh, crazy charismatic over there. He's, uh, you know, saying amen. You know, so, so I'm not from a church that says amen. And, and I'm not saying you have to. I'm not saying you have to. But uh, uh, I, I, I was not saved in a church with a lot of amens, but I was saved in the South. And I don't know if St. Louis is the South or not. I think you're still trying to make up your mind uh, uh, whether you're in the South or not. But whether you are or not, I hope that at least in your heart, you will say at least a good Presbyterian amen uh, to the things that we're saying. That the principles of interpreting the Word of God cannot be applied inconsistently. By looking at creation, well, we accept that as literal, but prophecy, we accept that as spiritual. Can't do it. Can't do it. The same principles of interpretation should be applied to all sections of Scripture. Now, Hosea is a love story. Hosea, the message of Hosea can be boiled down into this. Hosea's prophecy centers around Israel's relationship to the Lord, expressed by the metaphor of a marriage. Yahweh, or Jehovah, is the husband. Israel is his uh, wife. The message of Hosea can be boiled down to this. Israel is unfaithful to the marriage covenant. Yet Yahweh, or Jehovah, if you prefer that pronunciation, still loves her and wants her back and will go to great lengths to get her back. Now, under the metaphor of a marriage, Hosea becomes the message. Hosea and his wife actually become the message. Not only does Hosea give a message about the Lord's love for Israel, but Hosea is asked by God to live out that message as painful as it will be for Hosea. What do I mean by that? If you look at Hosea and the big picture, uh, in chapters 1 to 3, we have the tragedy in Hosea's home life. It has to do with his marriage. And it is intensely personal. Hosea's tragedy of an unfaithful wife in his marriage. And though we won't get to it tonight, uh, the rest of the book is tragedy in his homeland. Chapters 4 to 14. That is his message, and it's a national message for Israel as a whole. So here's the message. Yahweh loves Israel. Yahweh loves uh, his covenant people. They have gotten married at Sinai. But Israel has become unfaithful to her covenant Lord, the one that she was betrothed to. 
Now, Hosea, I'm going to ask you to not only stand and preach that message, Hosea, I'm going to ask you to portray that message with all of the heartbreak that you will experience so that people will know my heartbreak over my unfaithful wife, Israel. Tragedy in Hosea's home life. We'll just survey Hosea 1 to 2. I'll zero in on Hosea 3, which has great implications for pre-millennialism. -pre now, uh, Hosea is called, uh, and we are told that uh, uh, he is told to marry a woman who was unfaithful. Uh, the old King James has harlotries, ma ma uh, or whoredoms. A woman who is characterized by whoredoms. Whoredoms is not a word that you hear today, but I think you get the idea of what it is. Harlotries, adulteries, fornication, prostitution. Do you get the idea? Marry a woman who is characterized by giving herself away to the highest bidder giving away her body, selling it to others. Now, right away, that's a problem. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but why would God command the holy prophet to marry a prostitute? And I think the answer is this. She was not a prostitute when he married her, but she proved to be, she later became an adulteress. Uh, and left him and became a prostitute. And I think the analogy is the same with Israel. When God married Israel, she was a pure bride. She later became a spiritual prostitute when she went after other gods. Remember, in the Old Testament, uh, God and the prophets use uh, adultery as an illustration of idolatry and unfaithfulness to the Lord. Just as a, uh, a, a, a woman can become unfaithful to her husband or just uh, uh, the opposite, so Israel has become unfaithful to her heavenly husband by going after other gods, okay? So uh, when Israel married Yahweh at Mount Sinai, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, if I start uh, taking questions right in the middle, uh, I'm not sure I'll be able to get through. How about at the end? All right, good. All right, so, uh, uh, excuse me for that, but uh, if, if everybody starts raising hands, I'm not sure we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll get done. But if I'm not clear or I misspeak myself, tell me, okay? So, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that. Go marry a wife uh, who is characterized by adultery, or as the Old English has, whoredom. Now, the reason I say that is I think the first child is their child. Look at verse 3. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim. She conceived, watch, and she bore him a son. She bore him a son. Very clear. Very clear. The first child, uh, 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 who is named Jezreel, is their child. But when the second and third child are born, that same language, bore him a daughter, bore him a son, is not used. Uh, look please uh, at verse 6. She conceived again and bore a daughter. Doesn't say bore him a daughter. I think that's important. Then thirdly, uh, verse 8, uh, when she weaned uh, that child, she conceived and bore a son. So here I think the language is very clear. The first one, she bore him a son. The second and third, evidently she did not bear to him. It was children of her, as the old English says, harlotries or immorality. All right, so uh, I think that's what's going on here. He marries a wife. She proves to be unfaithful. Now, this can go each way, and I'm sure you know that, and I'm not trying to pick on the wives here. Of course not. This just happens to Hosea. A man can become unfaithful as well. But we're dealing with Hosea probably uh, because we're dealing with Yahweh is Israel's heavenly uh, husband, and Israel is uh, Yahweh's earthly wife. So it's Israel that becomes an adulteress. Well, just quickly, uh, they name the kids. What, what, what did you name your kids? Just remember, when you name your kids, 
they got to carry that name for a while, okay? So if you name them Esmeralda Hortense, when they get to the first grade, first grade and they announce their name as Esmeralda Hortense, just remember, they've got to live with that, okay? Now, uh, 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 our, our, our first child uh, was named Jonathan, because Jonathan means a gift from the Lord, and we considered him a gift from the Lord. Our second child was named Amy. Amy is French for beloved, and she's beloved of her parents and beloved of God, and that's a, uh, 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 that's, that's a good name. Uh, the third one was named Linda because we lived on Linda Lane. <laughs> L-Y-N-D-A. So she got stuck with Linda. But if any of you know Espanol, anybody here know Espanol? Espanol is not a barber. Uh, Espanol, linda, means pretty. Yes, and uh, she was pretty outside and on the inside. Enough of that, all right? Uh, now, uh, Hosea didn't go to a baby name book and say, uh, George. All right? Uh, God says, call him this, Jezreel, which means sown by God, not S-E-W-N. Notice, S-O-W-N. Sown means scattered like seed. Because Israel is going to be scattered. It's going to be scattered. It's interesting. It's, it's a double meaning. Sown can be good. Sown can be good, like sowing seed that grows. But sown can also mean scattered. And it's probably a double entendre here. Israel is sown by God, but Israel is also, because of her unfaithfulness, going to be scattered by God. Hey, uh, 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 Hosea, why'd you name your new kid? Jezreel. Why'd you name him Jezreel? Because you're going to be scattered by God. Thanks. Sorry I asked. Doesn't, doesn't the farmer need to scatter the seeds so that they can grow? Yes, it has a double meaning. It has positive and negative, okay? So now, secondly here, what's the second one? Uh, strange name here. Six, she conceived again and bore a daughter, and the Lord said to him, Call her no mercy. No mercy. Hey, Hosea, heard your wife had a daughter. Yeah, she had a daughter. What's her name? No mercy. Why would you name her that? Because God is not going to have mercy on you any longer. Again, he might say, Oh, sorry I asked. No mercy. She uh, has a, uh, I'm sorry, I skipped over one. Uh, no mercy. And then the third one, bore a son, and called him, not my people. Lo, ah, me, not my people. Hey, Hosea, heard your wife had a son. Yeah, she had a son. Uh, what was the name? Not my people. Why would you name him that? Because Israel is unfaithful and is no longer my people. You see, he's living out. The pain that Yahweh has with an unfaithful wife on earth, Israel. Right? So now there's the, the tragedy, the signs reflected in the children. Secondly, the sins reflected in the wife. It looks like from the language of chapter 2, 2 and 3, that Hosea puts his wife away. As a matter of fact, he says that very clearly in 2.2. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife. I am not her husband. In the terms of Deuteronomy 24, he put her away. And when she was gone was when her sins really reached to heaven. If you read through chapter 2, you see that evidently she descended into slave prostitution where she was bought and sold to the highest bidder. You can read it on your own. It's sad. It's heartbreaking that this woman married to a prophet would end up not only leaving him, not only going after other men, but evidently, from what we're going to see, descends so much that she becomes a slave prostitute, bought and sold to the highest bidder. Recently, I've been in a couple of conferences with folks who have a ministry to girls uh, who, oftentimes 14, 15 years old, have pimps, 
and they're slaves. They're slaves. Modern day slaves. Sex slaves. And my heart just goes out to those who minister to these girls. Why was I wrong? I thought they were all foreign girls who came here illegally. And then were put out on the street. Why was I wrong when I found out that well over 50% of the kids that they're ministering to, kids, they are kids, are American-born girls. I, I didn't know that. And they said, yeah. So if you say, this is all Old Testament, this is so thousands of years ago, yeah, they're still slave prostitutes. My daughter was involved in a ministry in Las Vegas when they were stationed close to there. My son-in-law is, a, is a, a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. Started by a gal who baked some cupcakes and took those cupcakes to an off-the-strip men's club, as they call them in Las Vegas, and knocked on the door and she said, I'd like to give these cupcakes to the girls. What are they going to do? She comes in and gives cupcakes to the girls. She comes back later with more cupcakes and more gifts. And then she starts uh, with now some help saying, can we come in and wash your hair? Can we come in and, and do your nails? You say, what? Yes. And they start to minister to these girls in the clubs who basically have pimps and are sex slaves. And slowly, slowly they show the love of Christ. And some of these girls come to Christ. And you know what you've got to do when you're in a ministry like that? It's not just cupcakes. You've got to have uh, uh, counseling on, on how to break them back into society. Uh, teaching them how to type, teaching them how to fix electric wires, uh, um, um, uh, teaching them how to emerge back in a life. And so now they have a halfway house because when you uh, get these girls to leave that, that life, you got to show them that there's a, some other life. What a ministry. What a ministry. I think if Jesus comes back, he's going to be pleased with ministries like that because you know what they criticized him for ministering to harlots okay uh, and Mary although, although it's not uh, any evidence that Mary Magdalene was a harlot uh, Jesus reached out to people who were broken wow okay so um, uh, sad story now we get to chapter 3 and this is what I want to focus in on chapter 3 the salvation of Israel ref, uh, and the salvation of Gomer reflected in her husband. Now zero in on chapter 3. Would you follow me please? The Lord said to me, notice the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Yahweh said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man. Wow, there it is. And she's an adulteress. Go again. Find her, Hosea. Love her. Show her your love. In all of her ugliness and in all of her sin, go and find her and love her. Now watch the comparison. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel. There's the comparison. He represents God she, Gomer, represents Israel. Just as she has become unfaithful to him, Israel has become unfaithful to me. You go and love her because I still love my people, Israel, as ugly as they are. That's love. That's love. They turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. Now somebody says, what's wrong with raisin cakes? Little Debbie raisin cakes? This is a, yeah. Evidently raisin cakes, and there's a couple of other references in Jeremiah that shows, were part of uh, 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 cultic meals uh, that were carried on in Baal worship. They would eat these raisin cakes that had been donated uh, uh, or, or dedicated to Baal. So don't worry about your little Debbie's cakes. Uh, it's idolatry. 
They turn to other gods and love these cultic festivals where they're participating in, in, in worshiping other gods. Just like she is unfaithful, my people are unfaithful. You go and you love her. Love her again. Go find her. Because that's the kind of love I have for my people Israel. As ugly and dirty as they are, I love them. All right, so that's... Uh, now watch the redemption. Verse 2. So I bought her. What do you got to do? Bought her? Why would you have to buy your wife? Remember, she's put away. She's no longer his wife. I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethek of barley. I bought her. Now we have to read between the lines here, but I think we can do it safely. This woman had descended into the depths of her sin so greatly, she was up for sale. She was up for sale. She was no longer his husband. So, what's he got to do to win her back? She belongs to somebody else. She belongs to a slaveholder. So what he's got to do, he's got to pay money. I know it sounds strange. But in days of slavery, he didn't, she didn't belong to him anymore. So he scrapes together his money and he doesn't even have enough money for the price of a slave. 30 pieces of silver was the traditional price of a slave. He didn't even have that. 15 shekels of silver. So he gets a bunch of barley together and makes up the rest. And I don't know if it was like the awful uh, scourge on our own country of, of uh, slaves being sold and people bidding. I, I don't know if it was exactly like that. But maybe it was. And what if it was? What if she hears five shekels and she's there? Who's going to take me? F Ten shekels. And then somebody says 15 shekels and maybe she recognizes his voice. And then somebody says 15 shekels and a, a bushel of barley. And then his last bid comes in. All that he has and she sold to the man who was once her husband. What drama? What drama? Now this happened in real life. This happened in space and time. But it's a parable and an illustration of something bigger than even Gomer and Hosea. Watch it. Verse 3. Uh, I said to her, you will dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or the harlot or belong to another man, so will I also be to you. Most commentators think that there was some sort of a period of time when they were back together, but they weren't back together. A time of disciplinary uh, when she was taken away from her harlotry, but they didn't come fully back together for a period of time. And maybe that's the case. But if that's the case, it is an amazing illustration, an absolutely astounding illustration of the gospel. She was redeemed. The language in the New Testament, agarazzo, ex agarazzo, lutrao, has to do, that we translate as redeemed, has to do with payment of a price. When you redeem something, you pay a price to buy back that which was originally yours. And it's that language in the New Testament for redemption that's marvelously illustrated here. Because our Lord Jesus Christ went into the slave market of sin and paid a price to buy us back from the slavery of sin. Got an amen there. <laughs> Went into the slave market and paid with the price of his own blood to buy us back. God did that for Israel too. But it's going to be a while before they fully come back. Now listen. Look at verse uh, 3 again. You shall not play the whore 
or belong to another man, so will I also be to you. Look at verse 4. For the children of Israel shall dwell, how long? Many days. Many days without king or prince. That's without any ruling authority uh, uh, as a king. Without sacrifice or pillar, there's any sacrifice. And then without ephod or teraphim, there's the prophets. Teraphim was the way uh, that you gained information wrongly. They'll be without teraphim, but they'll be without a word from God. Do you know what's being said here? After the Messiah of Israel goes into the market of sin and lays down his own blood for Israel, Israel will not come back right away. You say, how do you know it's Israel? Verse 4, for the children of Israel. So there's going to be a period of time, according to Hosea, even after the Messiah gives his blood to die for Israel, that Israel will not be back fully to the Lord, but they'll be without a king. They'll be without a priest. They'll be without a temple. They'll be without a sacrifice. That has been the situation of Israel since 70 A.D., Forty years after the Savior, the Messiah of Israel, died on the cross and rose again, Israel was without a king. Israel was without a temple and still is without a temple and without a sacrifice from 70 A.D. down to 2000 and A.D. The children of Israel will continue for many days without a king, without a temple, without a sacrifice. That is Israel's history for nearly now 2,000 years. Amazing. Absolutely astounding. You say, well, that's just the church. Look at the end of verse 1. The children of Israel. The beginning of verse 4. The children of Israel. If verse 1, which refers to the children of Israel, the Old Testament, or the Jewish people, if verse 4 is the Jewish people, the children of Israel, will dwell for many days without a king and without a temple, tell me that the children of Israel in verse 5 is different. Now here we get to our subject at hand. You say, it's about time. <laughs> Look at verse 5. Afterward, after this period of time when Israel is in exile, without a sacrifice, without a king, in exile, afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall come in fear to the Lord and His goodness in the latter days. After a period of time of exile, after a period of time of being the Lord's people, but not being the Lord's people. You see, Gomer came back. She was Hosea's wife, but she wasn't Hosea's wife. You see the point? Israel will be God's people, but they won't be God's people. They'll be God's chosen people, but they'll be wandering away like Gomer wandered. And even after the Messiah comes and pays the price for them, they refuse that price, and they're not back to the Lord yet. But thank the Lord, verse 5 says, after that period of time, the same language, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. Now, it is possible that some would say that this is a resurrected David. I don't think we uh, have to say that. David, in 2 Samuel 7, becomes the ancestor of who? The Messiah. So David here, I think, is a cryptic way of referring to the son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, when Jesus asks uh, the Pharisees, uh, uh, what say you, uh, who is the Messiah? What did they say? The son of David. Ask any Jewish people who believes their Bible, and not all of them do, I know that. They'll say, the Messiah is going to be a descendant of whom? They'll say David. They'll say David. So I think this is referring from 2 Samuel 7 on, the descendant of David, ultimately, the ultimate descendant of David, the ultimate son of David, 
will be the Messiah. And that's why Matthew 1.1 begins how? With a boring genealogy. Boring? The genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, son of Abraham. That's his credentials. That's his credentials. It's not boring. It's the fulfillment of the hope of Israel. Jesus, the son of David. So I think this is, is uh, a reference to uh, uh, the Father and the Son, the Lord their God, and David their King. Not necessarily a resurrected David, <laughs> a resurrected son of David, but not the resurrected king of David. His descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ, and Israel will come back, just as I believe that we can say that Gomer came back fully to Hosea, and, and it wasn't a corny ending. They lived happily ever after. Someday Israel will wake up we're going to see in the second hour how they will wake up. It's going to take Yahweh coming back and they see Him and they will mourn for Him. It's going to take that, but they will come back just as we can rest assured that Gomer came back to Hosea. The children of Israel, after a long period of exile, will come back in repentance and come in fear to the Lord. When? In the latter days. In the eschatological period of the latter days. Israel's future salvation will take place. My friend, if you have not yet caught the relevance of this to premillennialism, let me just tell you what it means. The premillennial view that there will be a thousand year period over which Christ will reign over the earth has to do with the return of Jewish people not only to the land but to the Lord. When they shall look upon Him whom they have pierced as we'll see in the second session and they mourn for Him as we're going to see tomorrow morning all Israel shall be saved. That is the central plank of premillennialism. And if that is not true, that Israel will come back to the Lord and to the land, then premillennialism is false. But you know what? Our whole Bible is false if that's true. I told this to the folks at dinner. I sat in the office of a president of a seminary that's given to amillennialism. He himself was an amillennialist, meaning no future thousand year period, and Israel is the church. Okay? And I, I was talking with him, the president of this seminary, and he had just returned from a trip to Israel, where he had seen the Jewish people numbering just in the few thousands in 1880, now numbering seven million in the land of Israel with their own country, with a revived Hebrew language. The only nation in the world to go into exile, lose their language, then come back to their original land and rediscover their ancient language. Never before in the history of the world. Is that a lucky break for the Jews? Or is something else going on, my friend? And he said, you know what, you premillennialists, he says, you might be right after all. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, what I saw in Israel, he says, I don't know how you can explain that away just by human luck or coincidence. Now, I'm not going to say he became a card-carrying premillennialist. But it shook his own theology to the core that this people gone into exile, most Nations that go into exile disappear into the, into the bends of history. But these Jewish people survived and have begun to come back, have their own nation. Yes, they're still without the Lord. There's only a remnant there. Of course I know that. But this is preparing for the day. I'm not preaching on Ezekiel 37, the dry bones. But I think that's, that's what's going to happen. The bones 
Ezekiel preaches to a graveyard of bones and the bones come back together and he sees all these bones and there's just a bunch of skeletons. Son of man, can these bones live? Well, if you ask me, Lord, they don't look like they got much life. It, it, it's going to take a miracle. And it did. Prophesied to the bones. The bones came together. Prophesied to the Ruach, the Spirit. And the Spirit blew on those bones. And the bones came to life. The bones came to life. And what did uh, God say to Ezekiel? Ezekiel, this is the church. No. <laughs> He says, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, we're dry, we're lost, we've got no hope. These bones are the whole house of Israel and someday the Spirit of the Lord is going to blow on these regathered bones and they're going to come to life. This, these, this is the very central plank of premillennialism, folks. And Hosea says it, the children of Israel went a whoring, the children of Israel uh, 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 will spend a long time without these things, and then the children of Israel will come back. If the children of Israel are the Jews in verse 1, if the children of Israel are the Jews in verse 4, why do we make the children of Israel the church in verse 5? That is an inconsistent hermeneutic. And if you don't know what hermeneutics is, Herman was the worst one of those Udix boys. <laughs> Hermeneutics is simply the system of interpretation. Are we going to accept the language of Scripture as it's written, or are we going to spiritualize it? I know what I'm going to accept. It. When it says children of Israel, that's a children of Israel. So if you're wondering what Hosea has got to do with premillennialism, much in every way. Much in every way. And we're going to see how that works out even more in the second session, if you can handle the heat. I hope you can. You should be in Los Angeles. Two days ago, one, zero, nine. Five minutes for questions. Yes, speak loudly. You mentioned that the Lord married. Yes. At Mount Sinai, a covenant relationship, formal relationship between Yahweh on Mount Sinai and Israel, His covenant people, just like the covenant of marriage. You see this in Malachi. Malachi talks about the covenant of marriage. Hosea talks about the covenant of marriage. I don't disagree with marriage. Uh, Isaiah 54, your maker is your husband. So, I mean, agreement with that. I just didn't realize the marriage was made. And so when you say on Mount Sinai, how Let me say, was ratified, ratified. Was my wife my wife from the time I uh, asked her to be my wife? No. But in a sense, she was. We were bound together. But at that time when I said, I do, and I will do this, and I will do that, and she said, I will do that, that was when our relationship was ratified. Okay? So on Mount Sinai, the relationship between Israel brought out of Egypt now is ratified. And Israel becomes the wife of Yahweh officially. With the charter and the agreement, they said uh, at the foot of Mount Sinai, all the Lord has said we will do. It's like, uh, uh, w w uh, will you take this man to be your wife? Uh, husband, yes. Uh, yes, I will do that. Will you do this? Yes. Israel, will you do this? Yes. Now Israel broke it. Israel broke it. And the prophets say Israel broke it and became unfaithful. Hence, that's the background of Hosea. Yes? Okay, you said um, as a pre mill person, like, like I am, most of us here, it, it, it changes how you look at the Bible. So yes. How does an um, mill person like that pastor? Yes. I'm not going to say he doesn't believe the Bible. He, yes. Uh, how does an amillennialist believe the Bible? If, uh, if this... Uh, all right. Okay, and amillennialists, how do they view the Bible? Okay. Uh, a believing amillennialist believe the Bible is true. Absolutely. We're not going to say that they're liberals. That would be wrong. We have a different principle of interpretation. 
They believe that the history is literal, but the prophecy is spiritual. They believe that history should be taken literally, believing amillennialists. But when it comes to prophecy, God speaks in riddles, God speaks in dark sayings, and we can't take them literally. So, so uh, they have a very simple eschatology. The Lord comes and that's it. Vast areas of revelation are either neglected or explained away. Vast areas of Old Testament prophecy about the details of the kingdom are just spiritualized. Uh, when Hosea, uh, when uh, Ezekiel preached to those bones, that's talking about the new birth. That's talking about sinners coming to Christ and being born again. Uh, when the Spirit of God comes into us, they say that's when the Spirit of God blew upon the bones of, uh, of, of, uh, of Ezekiel. That's just sinners coming to Christ. They spiritualize it all. Well, it is speaking about new birth, but it says, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. As they say, our hope is lost. I will come back and I will breathe into them. No, if they're the whole house of Israel... Lost, they're the whole house of Israel when they are saved. And uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Amillennialists don't have prophecy conferences. <laughs> Why? It's very simple. The Lord comes and that's it. And if you're just looking for some simple way, but if you do, you're neglecting vast swaths of the Word of God that have a lot to say to us. Yeah. No, no, yeah, no prophecy conference is not <laughs> It's very simple. Lord comes and that's it. Yeah. Uh, uh, last question. I'm a, I'm a little simple. And I it am takes too. takes a while for things to sink into me. Oh, God. When you were talking... Yeah, <laughs> that's good. And when you were talking about uh, Hosea being... I don't think you used the term divorce... But I got the idea of divorce from his wife or separate. Deuteronomy 24 says you can put her away if, if some uncleanness is found in her. Does that mean that she was, he was actually divorced from yes, her? Then? Yes, in, the, in, in Old Testament terms. Okay. He put her away because he found an unclean thing in her. But God told him to do that. And, and, uh, but now, instead of just leaving her, go back and, and win her back. Win her back, Hosea. Love her back. That's the great message of love. That is filthy. Imagine how filthy she was. And he loved her back. Imagine how filthy my people are. And I still love them, Yahweh says. Thank you for your patience and your understanding. And, and uh, I know the heat is tough. Father, thank you for these precious people who love your word. And thank you. Years ago, a punky kid who thought I had the world on a string and it came crashing down when my dad died. Thank you that you used that to bring me to Christ and to teach me from this precious Schofield Reference Bible. Thank you for...